Hey guys, today we're gonna take you on a little tour of the shop. Okay, that audio sucked. Let's try this again. Today, we're gonna teach you the critical lessons that we've learned after being in business for 10 years that took us from our condo to a 10,000 square foot building. Before we start with this building, we're gonna take it back to working in the condo. I was basically doing AutoCAD design for metal work and we were building metal table legs for other makers that made wooden tops. This was, you know, back in 2012, I was liking and commenting on all these posts and I ended up getting a lead for a job for 104 tables. So picture this, I'm working out of my condo, getting an inquiry for 104 tables and I realistically should have just said no because that job was way outside of my scope at the time. I decided to take it on and I got the deposit check and I, I think it was about three months from the time I got the deposit check to the time I had to deliver these tables because it was for Way Home Festival up in Barrie, up north and here on Ontario. So I took on the job, got the deposit, and in that three months, I had to find a shop, buy machines, figure out how to use the machines because I wasn't an everyday woodworker. I was also getting married, going on a honeymoon, and moving houses. So you can imagine that was pretty stressful, but I went for it anyways, and that was sort of a huge risk that I took because it all could have went south very fast. I guess that first lesson is take some chances Go outside of your comfort zone. If you're always being super conservative or staying inside of your comfort zone, you're never gonna have those big risk, big reward opportunities. Long story short, finished the job. We spent about a year in that old shop and it was like, first shop was super ghetto. It was not very nice. When it rained, water would leak in and go all under my table saw. It was a disaster. Anyways, we I just kept reinvesting. Every job I would get, I would buy you know a better machine or more wood or just keep the money going back into the business. And after a year in that shop, that's when we moved here. When I moved in here, I was still a kind of a one-man show. It was just me. So I was quoting the jobs, delivering jobs, building the jobs, doing all the design work. From top to bottom, it was just a kind of one person. That was me. After I got way too busy, I was working way too long a days, I realized I needed to hire somebody and that was also outside of my comfort zone. It was kind of easy for me to go in the shop, come to the office and bounce back and forth and do all the work, but I wasn't able to keep up. So I decided to hire someone and I, I guaranteed them 20 hours a week because I was scared that I wouldn't have enough work for them. Basically I guaranteed that 20 hours a week and I remember this clearly, the guy ended up working 50 plus hours a week every single week the entire time he worked here for I think it was three or four years. I was so scared about committing to more than 20 hours. Meanwhile, I had 50 hours of work. We got more jobs and that kind of ball just started rolling. Again, that was outside of my comfort zone. So be calculated a little, but take some risks and you'll get some bigger reward. Let's go to the, our first shop, which looks a little different now, but we'll show you that room now. This was our original shop when, when I moved in here and it was just me. Those doors didn't exist and this room looked a lot different. You know, in here there was jointer, planer. I had like a miter station on that wall. There was a big mezzanine up top uh, where we stored a lot of materials like barn board. Yeah, we were just pumping tables out. Everything would kind of come in and out that garage door. So there was no forklift for unloading lifts of lumber or anything like that. And we just kind of grinded out table after table. I remember there was only two tables to work on in here. And at one point we had five tables stacked up and we were like just sanding the, the top table and then we'd swap them and sand the next one and swap it because there was no space to do anything else but we had so many jobs at the time. From there, I ended up working out in the shop a little bit more and we hired uh, in the office to help out there with some of the admin work. So that was like, a, you know, another scary hire because the first employee was scary but the second employee was also a little scary because it's a bit of a commitment, but those were the best decisions I've ever made. And now we've got nine or 10 employees now. I can't even keep track anymore, but don't be afraid to hire if, uh, if that's holding you back. We're just table after table, just grinding out these tables. And uh, meanwhile, I was, you know, liking, commenting and, and just engaging on social media. I was starting to build a bit of a social media following because I was active, posting every day, responding to comments and DMs, liking other people's work, and just being like an active member of that Instagram woodworking community. You doing an MMA? An MMA is a money-making activity. So oftentimes I see people get distracted. You know, they go to do a, a quick search on YouTube or Google to find an answer for something, and then they end up down a rabbit hole of things unrelated to what they were trying to do. So I try to make it a common practice to ask myself, is this a money-making activity? And sometimes it's not, and I'm still guilty of it. I'm still working on it, but always ask yourself that. Try not to get too distracted and try to stay on those money-making activities and those kind of like top of the to-do list items and not get too far into the, uh, into the weeds or, you know, distracted in, in YouTube and Google. 
Then I got an email from somebody saying, hey, I have a huge job, meet me at a Starbucks and sign an NDA. So my first thought was like, I'm not gonna go to Starbucks to sign an NDA because I didn't feel comfortable about it. No, 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 no wait, wait, it's okay. It's okay. But again, went outside of my comfort zone, went to the Starbucks, quickly read this NDA, signed it, and they sent me the drawings and it was a, a restaurant job for the Montreal Canadiens. So it's the biggest restaurant in Canada at the Montreal Canadiens arena. And we got all the point of sale units and bar rails, bar tops. There, it was a big job, about a quarter million dollars in total. So obviously we couldn't do that in this room. There was all this warehouse space behind us that the building next door was using just for storage. I asked them if we could add 2000 square feet onto our thousand square foot shop. And they said, yeah, so we, Knocked the hole in the wall, added some doors, and then we added this shop. Now we're in sort of our main shop that we're still in today. This shop's about 2,000 square feet. Basically got the shop only for the Montreal Canadian job, and I was a little stressed because I was thinking, what do I do after the Montreal Canadian job? Do I have enough jobs to keep a shop this size and the new rent and the employees that I hired to do that job? How do I keep them all busy? We just kept filming things on Instagram, posting and engaging, and. That was our main driver to get quotes and, and ultimately jobs in the shop. It didn't look like this when we moved in day one. This was a work in progress over the years. So if you're thinking like, I want a shop like that, but I'm not there yet, it, it takes time. I started with an empty room here. This None of this was here. This was just concrete floor and drywall walls. Build a work table and you need a bigger table. You build another work table. You buy your sheets of HDPE if you need them. And you know, you add cabinets and build a miter station. We had an old Craftex table saw. Step by step, and it not all shows up at once. You gotta keep reinvesting, reinvesting, and that's how you slowly build. And then it could turn into this or bigger. There's no, no reason why you couldn't go bigger. Fast forward a few years, we're working in here, making tables and doing other big projects. Clients would come in to look at their tables or pick out slabs. That room we were just in that was full of slabs. Customers would see them and say, hey, do you sell this? Do you sell that? And eventually I realized I should probably turn this room into a retail space and make it open to the public so that the general public can come in, buy slabs, wood finish, epoxy, etc. We converted that room into retail and what kind of evolved from that was people online on Instagram would see that from you know different parts of Canada and the United States and other parts of the world. And they would ask, how can I buy that? How can I buy that? And ultimately that led us to starting Jeff Max Supply, which is the online store. There's a saying, what got you here today won't get you there tomorrow. So if we just stayed in our lane, built tables, 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 you know, we'd be fine. But we were able to expand on the business and have like kind of multiple pillars of revenue. So if, you know, the table business slowed down, maybe the retail side would pick up. And if the retail side was slow and tables were slow, the online store would be pulling its weight. It's important to have more than one revenue stream. You don't want to put all your eggs into one basket. You can, it's just risky. And if that goes south, then you know, what's next. So try to have a couple different revenue streams that can kind of be a bit of a backup plan if anything happens. I'll show you guys, you know, a little bit of what's going on and some of the tools and machines we have and kind of what we use on a daily basis. We've got this Holy Tech planer. It's only a 24 inch planer, but bigger than the Craft X. I think it was a 15 inch planer that we used to have. So a good upgrade. There's bigger ones, obviously, but this does the job for us. It's It's been a good investment. We have a 25 inch uh, King drum sander, which that comes in handy if we're doing a dining table and we'll sand both panels and then glue it back together. The saw stop, as I mentioned, this was a big upgrade. I actually had one of my employees set it off with their finger by accident. Yeah, I forget what he was working on, but very seasoned woodworker. It's not like he was brand new to any of this, but yeah, I ended up setting it off with his thumb and uh, it was the smallest little nick. This isn't a promo for saw stop. This is a, you know, a reason why you, you should invest in tools like this. So he, he nicked his finger, there was a little bit of blood. He, he was back to work in like an hour. He stopped working, you know, went and had a coffee just to calm his nerves a bit, but he could have lost his thumb there. That would have been bad for him, bad for us, and overall huge negative experience. But because of the saw stop, yeah, he was back at it within an hour after having a quick coffee just to calm things down. So definitely reinvest in safety. You can't, you can't go wrong with the saw stop. Another big investment was the CNC. We used to just send out all of our slabs for flattening. So pay a guy to come out in his van, we'd load in the tables that were rough out of the form. He'd take them back to his shop, CNC them, bring them back here, we'd have to unload them. So it was a big kind of waste of time and money because I was paying him to drive and flatten and drive again. So we, we bought this CNC to flatten all the slabs in-house. That's been a huge time saver. Obviously this is an investment. I think this machine was around $40,000, but there's smaller options and if it makes efficiency sense, then uh, it's worth the investment. What's up with that? 
This is uh, the dumping grounds. With a busy shop, you kind of end up with a bunch of extra junk just laying around and you end up busy working on tables and not necessarily organizing and cleaning as much as we should. So yeah, this is a work in progress. We started our online store after we had a bit of success in our in-store retail space. And when we first started, I'll show you, all we had was this one corner. All we had was this because all this space belonged to the metal company next door. So they had all their metal coils out here and, and I kind of bugged them. I'm like, hey, can I just get one corner back here? And then we had access to the bay door as well. Yeah, we had one shipping table, a couple little racks. We, we didn't start with an online store that had seven or 800 items. That's very overwhelming, but you got to start with something. So we actually started with Ecopoxy sales, doing it over email. We tell people to email in if they wanted Ecopoxy. We would give them the price over, e like it was so archaic, but that's how we started. It wasn't the best solution, but it was a solution that brought in revenue until we could invest and take the time building the actual online store so people could go on, pay with their credit card, and then we figure out the shipping side of it. Baby steps, you know, the, don't let perfect get in the way of good and uh, do something, you know? After a year of working from this and we kind of proved the concept of the online store, I was able to convince the metal guys who had all their stuff back here to move right out. And we basically took over the rest of the building. So I'll show you guys that. It's our trusty forklift. We just slapped a new battery in her and she's just like brand new. Over the years, obviously we kept adding products and more products to expand our offering. We were always asking our consumers, you know, what they wanted us to carry in our store. All the while I was still active on Instagram, started being more active on Facebook and just finding different ways to leave my mark to get in front of new eyes. A lot of the footage that we film in the shop is very satisfying to watch. So random people on the internet will just watch it and then they start following and then they think, hey, I wanna make a serving board or I wanna buy a table. And the more content you can create, the more sales you're naturally gonna get because you're gonna get into more eyes. It's ultimately, it's a numbers game. So, you know, you might post 10 Instagram posts in a row and it not have a lot of success, but that doesn't mean you quit because that 11th one could be the one that takes off and gets that sale that leads to another sale. And don't get discouraged if the numbers aren't there early on. It, you know, I started at zero followers and worked my way up, but it took a long time. We kept adding products. Now we've got, I think over 800 products on our online store. We just kept adding them one by one. Slowly built up our product offering. We started hiring more employees. We actually developed two of our own brands, which are Beaver Dust Pigments to compete in the pigment space. And then also Empire Molds to compete in the pre-made reusable mold space. So, you know, after selling those products from other companies, I kind of learned like these are high moving items. I, you know, I was a little more passionate about those than say an oil finish or an actual epoxy brand. So I decided to start my own companies there and that was big risk. There was a lot of money that went out to start those companies, but that's how I reinvest. I could have went out and bought a couple of cars <laughs> with the money I put into starting those two companies, but I knew that that would pay off and it would be like kind of one step backwards to get two steps forward. You know, where if I didn't take that leap and step out of my comfort zone, we still be kind of stagnant in the same spot and not have the opportunity with these other two brands. If this all seems overwhelming, I'll kind of share with you a little technique that I use to break down those big scary goals. Picture a pyramid and at the top of the pyramid is your big goal. So let's say your goal is to get out of your garage into a say a 2000 square foot shop because that would be you know a big breakthrough and that allows you to get some bigger jobs and so on. So at the top of the pyramid you're going to have your 2000 square foot shop. Now that, that's intimidating for a lot of people. What do you need to sell to pay the bills of a 2000 square foot shop? Maybe it's, you know, two tables a month and 10 serving boards, and that'll just get you by. You're not making any extra money, but that'll get you by and pay your bills. So top of your pyramid, you've got your, your big goal of $2,000 a month shop. Then you've got your two tables and 10 charcuterie boards. Then underneath that, how are you going to get the jobs for two tables, 10 charcuterie boards? Maybe that's sending DMs or emails to 10 interior designers a week. That's totally plausible, not too crazy. And then you're gonna reach out to 10 realtors a week for serving boards, because that's kind of an easy sell. Now that's your next layer of the, the pyramid. That's kind of your base layer of your actionable daily tasks. If you've got a spare few minutes, send off a DM, send off a message, work on your website, get yourself in a position so that you can get those two tables and 10 boards a month. And you know, it's all gonna be baby steps. So, you know, one designer that you sign up now and then another real estate agent next time and you just slowly build that and it's not gonna all happen in the first week. It might take three months before you get to that point, but then you can justify the big 2000 square foot shop when you're ready. 
I've got one more tip that I think will resonate with all businesses. So let's go in the shop, come with me. One of the biggest mistakes I see other makers make, whether they're big or small, even big companies do this, is they make it too difficult for the customer to just give you money. What I'm saying is like, money follows the path of least resistance. Back in the day when customers would try to buy a table from me, they would say, hey, I'm interested in a dining table. And I would respond with, how big of a dining table do you want? They would say 96 inch by 42 inch. And then I would say, what kind of wood do you want? And it was this 20 email long chain. Time kills all deals. So if they lose interest or they find it somewhere else, like I should be getting all those answers in the first email. What size of the table? What kind of wood? Here's some examples. Check out our website. Better yet, have a quote form for them to fill out so that you gather all the info that you need so that you can give them a price within 24 hours of their inquiry. That idea, that thought is still kind of hot on their mind when they get their price, they're more likely to pull the trigger actually buying the table instead of it taking a week or two to email back and forth and it's just, it's just a headache. You should make it as easy as possible. So remove any and all friction points of them being able to pay you and work out the details with the customer. Examples of this is having a clear website. Make it clear as to what you make, where you're located. You know, the last thing you want is like a customer in Colorado and you're in Toronto and they think they're talking to someone local and then that kills the deal. So make sure that you're always communicating clearly with what the customer is gonna expect so that there's no like, I wonder what it's gonna look like. Or, you know, if you can do a, a mock-up for them, or send them a photo of a previous table, that is a good example. Yeah, you just wanna remove all those friction points. If they wanna pay with their visa, do you have a way for them to pay with visa? If they're gonna write you a check, where do they mail it to? Hey, you could pay with check, you can mail it here, you can pay with visa, just call this number. Make it super easy so if they're ready to buy, they go right away. One thing I did early on is as customers kept asking questions, I would write them all down and compile them so that I knew I could add that info to the website or to the quote form or to my email correspondence because for future table sales, I kind of know that those questions are coming and if I can answer them before they even have to ask, they'll one, think we're a professional and a proper company and two, it'll remove that time and resistance to initial inquiry to collecting payment. So that concludes our video, but I want you to leave a comment with some advice for somebody who's brand new to business. Doesn't matter the industry. Hopefully some of our you know, new business owners and people that wanna get into business can use this comment section as a bit of a learning page and get some real value out of it. So don't forget to like and subscribe and follow us for more.